So uh, things are a little bit different this morning. Now, we had intended to do everything outside, so um, just pretend you're in this very serene environment with waterfalls and mountains, and or we're in here, you know, but that's, that's great. It's really good to be with you guys this morning. Hope you guys are having a good uh, Labor Day weekend um, and enjoying the sunshine. Uh, we had called it off because... I got in my car this morning and I had to use the uh, windshield wipers, so that's why we're in here this morning. So, <laughs> so anyways, um, just a few announcements, if I can find them. Um, so first off, Seek God for Ferndale is kicking off next Sunday. Um, next Sunday here at 6, 6 to 8. Uh, we're going to watch a, uh, a movie called Appalachian Dawn, just talking about um, what God did in this community, how he transformed a community through prayer. We're going to spend some time praying for our community. I encourage you guys to come to that. Um, so next week at 6. Uh, also starting next week, Sunday mornings, uh, Kevin Carver is going to resume his class on boundaries. And we'd really encourage you guys to come and, uh, and check that out. You know, we, we all have a limited amount of time and energy. And uh, really the intent of boundaries is to find out um, what can we limit so that God can use us to our fullest. So um, come, it'll be right here at 9. And he's going to, he did four weeks of it earlier in the, in the year. And he's going to recap all that. So if you didn't come to the first part, um, you'll get caught up real quick. So come to that. Um, also next week, we're doing a, a, a youth and youth parent meeting um, for uh, teenagers and their parents. We're going to meet up in the deep end, which is an upstairs in the, uh, in the building with the gym across here. And we're just going to talk about the exciting things that are going on this year in our youth ministry, um, answer questions. And, you know, we're really going in a new direction in youth ministry, and it's exciting, and it's cool to be a part of that team. And so um, we just want to tell you about what God's been doing and where we're headed. So if, if you're a teenager or a parent, um, we would invite you to come after church next Sunday. So come to that. And... Uh, we also have a men's breakfast on the 15th at 8 a.m. here. So if you're a man and you eat breakfast, come, come then. I know most of you do. So, um, so as you guys can tell, Bill, if you want to bring the map up, we are starting life group signups this week. So let's clap. Come on, let's clap. So this is, uh, this is our life group map. So this year, God's given us eight life groups, and we're excited about this. Um, we want you to ask us questions about the different groups, and they're, they're being formed. They're going to kick off um, after September 23rd. And uh, if you're not signed up, sign up and, and get on board. And my hope is that, you know, we're starting this fresh this year, but my hope is that we'd have a lot more arrows uh, as we continue on. And, and basically, life groups are going to go from uh, the, basically the school year, so September to May, and um, we might start some new groups as, as things keep up maybe uh, in December, and so I want to talk to you a little bit about what God is doing there. So, thanks, Bill. Yeah. So that's the map. So it looks really cool, but yeah, let's start some more groups, get some more arrows. Um, but let me share a little bit from the Word. So if you guys remember last week, uh, we talked about the new, uh, the, the new um, philosophy, the new direction of life groups, and that they encompass uh, the ideas of living life in, and living life out, and living life for all. And last week I talked about in, and uh, that we have, uh, in your life groups, you'll have two in nights a month. And basically what an end night is, is it focuses on spiritual growth. So that's the end night. We talked about that last week. Um, this week I wanted to talk a little bit about out and what, why we're doing out nights. And uh, I might have mentioned this last week, but out nights are about serving together. And um, I just wanted to talk about why we're doing that, why we're setting aside time to serve together as a community. So if you have your Bibles today... Um, Luke 10, 33. We're just going to look at that real quick. So 
So most of you know the, uh, the passage of the Good Samaritan, right? Um, if, you, if you don't, I'll give you a short synopsis. Uh, basically, there's a man doing this uh, dangerous hike, and he fell among robbers, and the robbers beat him up and uh, took all his stuff and left him half naked in the, uh, in the wilderness. And um, first, a priest walked by. So to put that in today's terms, your, your, uh, your lead pastor walked by, and he looked at his watch, and he said, no, I can't, I can't deal with this right now, and he just passed on by. And the second guy was a Levite, and the, uh, the Levite was like the associate pastor of the day. And, and he looked at his watch, and he was thinking about all the things the lead pastor was having him do. And he was like, uh, no, I can't, I can't deal with this today. I'm just kidding, Bill. Um, I, can't, I can't deal with this today. I'm going to leave you on the side of the road. Sorry. And he, he took the other side. Um, so finally, this good Samaritan, this uh, regular guy, right, this just normal guy, despised like somebody that that the, uh, the pastors would look down on, right? The, the, the Israelites would look down on. He comes and, and he helps this guy. And I want to read verse 33 because it catches the heart of what out nights are about. So he said, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So that's the whole point of, uh, of out nights, is that we would have compassion and uh, look at needs in our community, in our church, even in our life groups. And so we wanted to set aside time for this to happen. Um, you know, at church, we're, it's really easy to, uh, to do things that benefit us. You know, we're humans, and we, we like to do things that, that ultimately benefit us. But without nights, we wanted to set aside a time to, um, to give to God as a community to show compassion to other people. And so this could look like a bunch of different things, practically. Uh, we're setting aside one time a month in your life group to do things like throw a community car wash and maybe you bring your cars and maybe the kids go around and they knock on neighbor's doors and say, hey, you know, we're washing cars and, you know, you want to bring yours over and we just get to know people in our community that way. Or maybe there's a need here in the church that's been here forever and we just need a, a group to come and spend a night and scrub all the stains out of the carpet in the gym, you know? <laughs> Um, it could be anything like that, um, but the heart, the heart of uh, the, the heart of God is is to serve, and it's compassionate, and He's had compassion on us, and so we want to show compassion to other people. So that's the whole idea of uh, of out nights. And so, anyways, next week I'll talk a little bit about all nights and how they all fit together. So, so thanks, guys. I'm going to ask Bill to come up, and we're actually going to enter into a time of communion. Thank you, Pastor Tyler. Uh, again, that rhythm of life groups is in, out, in, all. Say it with me. In, out, in, all. That's the monthly rhythm that we're going to uh, take in our life groups. And, and I tell you what, it, it sounds really simple, but this is a lot of, of connection and relationships that Tyler's been building, listening to folks in our church body and finding out what works best for us. Uh, and we're excited to see uh, what God is going to do through this. So we look forward to it. Thanks. Uh, speaking of doing things all together, we're going to take communion together today. We're going to do it a little bit differently uh, today. I'm going to ask the, server, the servers to come forward. What we're going to do today is I'm going to read the text in 1 Corinthians uh, that we, we normally read through. I'm going to read it through, and then after that, we're going to have a time of, of silent reflection and uh, taking communion, and we're going to do it all together, but the, here's how we're going to do it today uh, when we read the text, we'll all stand up and then uh, reflect. And when you're ready to take communion, exit your row on the left, all right? Come down the aisle, uh, tear off a piece of bread and dip it in the uh, juice and then eat it right then and then walk back to your seat and reflect. And we do that. Uh, the body of Christ broken for us, uh, his blood shed for us. Let's stand in reverence to the word of God. This is 1 Corinthians 11. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also he took the cup 
after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, it's our heart here together to partake of communion in remembrance of what Jesus has done for us. God, we come to you messed up, broken. So we pray that you would prepare our hearts to take communion. God, that you would be glorified through your people. Not just as a bunch of individuals, but God, you would be glorified in this community as we celebrate what you have done for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. Brothers and sisters, as you're ready, come forward and take communion. It's easy to get into a certain rhythm in church life. And it's times when we do things just a little bit differently. Uh, And I know that the bread is leavened bread, yeah. It's grape juice and not wine, yeah. But when we mix things up a little bit, do you ever get that sense of renewal, of refreshment? Just kind of a little sense of refocused uh, energy. Praise God for that. I'm going to encourage you uh, to sign up for life groups for the, over the next three weeks. Pray about which life group you want to sign up for and, and sign up in the back. Uh, it's something great that God is doing, and, and we want everybody to be a part of that. Last week I announced uh, that you may be seeing some changes in the building, in the gym building. If you were at our breakfast this morning, you saw some of those changes. Uh, we're renovating the building over there, and uh, also we're, we'll be putting in a, a playground, a place for the kids to play right outside the gym building there. So you saw that area staked off as well, uh, and that's, that's a blessing that our church body uh, praises the Lord for, that it, it wasn't uh, any amount of fundraising. It's, uh, it's not coming out of the budget, um, but God provided money for us to, to move forward on that. And we're excited about that. We as a church are about gathering together and scattering, uh, not as individuals, but as a faith community. Uh, we get back to the basics today, asking ourselves, what are we about as a church? <laughs> I, know, I know it's not a coincidence, the passage that we have uh, in the Word today. Uh, I, I didn't arrange this. Uh, the Holy Spirit did. Uh, God, God's really good at that, isn't he? He has just perfect timing like that. Uh, we wanted to do a Back to the Basics service as folks got back into the swing of fall and school starting and whatnot, and, and God's Word gives us a real wake-up call as to what's important. So let's pray before we get into the Word today. Father, uh, we, we pray that our time is glorifying to you, that it's pleasing to you. God, we come here with a lot on our minds and our hearts. Father, we lift up the Tenclay family as they mourn the loss of Henny. We know that she's in a better place. God, we know that she uh, is in a place with no suffering, no pain, that she is with you. There's no question. And Father, we who are still left here, pray that we could live out lives that honor and please you until we get to meet you face to face. We pray all these things in Jesus' name, the one who will return one day through the Holy Spirit. Amen? Uh, Last Sunday, we had a church... uh, picnic at Hovander. It was a great time, actually. We weren't, my wife Darby and I weren't planning on being there as long as we were. In fact, we were delayed coming home, and which wasn't a problem for our kids, but we have a new puppy in our house. Uh, We have an eight-month-old Great Dane puppy, uh, over a hundred pounds of puppy goodness, and that puppy does not like to be delayed. Uh, We call her My Little Pony. And My Little Pony doesn't really like to be delayed. She doesn't know what to do in the meantime when we're gone. And when we got back, having been at Hovander Park much longer than we had anticipated, uh, we got home and uh, Luna, her her name is, My Little Pony had found our six six rolls of toilet paper (laughs) and shredded them all over the carpet. 
Uh, she maxed out her fun as she chewed through our carpet and ran around the house knocking things down. And the, the, She knocked over a three-gallon uh, bucket of water that we had for her. It was all over the floor. The house was a wreck. Needless to say, uh, my little pony did not make good use of her time while we were delayed. She maxed out her fun. <laughs> Uh, it'd be nice to train a dog to do the dishes or something. Huh? It'd be great to come home and the dishes are done or the laundry's folded or something. But we, too, uh, have a hard time waiting in the meantime for Jesus to return. When it feels like Jesus is delayed, sometimes we max out our fun and we have a hard time knowing what to do in the meantime while we wait. We know he'll come in the future, amen? Amen. We know he will return, but sometimes I think when we see that Jesus will return in the future, it's kind of an out-of-sight, out-of-mind mentality. We know it's something that will happen, but probably not in our lifetime. We fall into sins that we don't root out and ask God to help us with. We get lazy. We get complacent. We get cranky, we get critical. We start to pick apart other believers even. We know Jesus will come, but sometimes it's out of sight, out of mind when it comes to the second coming of Christ. And so today we're going to see in God's word what we do in the meantime. When Jesus is delayed, what are we to do? And we'll see in a series of parables what Jesus, the stories that Jesus tells, what people did in the meantime. Or you'll see in each parable that there's a delay or there's this waiting period. And that's the key to each one of these parables. That's what they all have in common of what do people do in the meantime. And I'll tell you up front, the, the guiding principle of today is to max out your life in the meantime. Max out in the meantime. If you have a credit card, what does it mean to max out a credit card? All right, it's not good. You're right. What does it mean to max out a credit card, though? You take it to the limit. You take it to the limit. If you're, if you're working out, coaches say, give 110%. I don't know how that's possible, but give 110%. Max out that workout. We're challenged in the word to max out in the meantime. Don't just coast by, but to max out, make the most out of this waiting period. Turn with me to Matthew 24. All right, Jesus is talking to his disciples. We learned last week that uh, our response to the second coming of Christ is to stay awake. Verse 42. We're in Matthew 24, verse 42. It says, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know what day your Lord is coming. And Jesus is telling them, uh, watch out. Max out. He's, he's going to say, the reason you're to max out your life, the reason you're to make the most of this waiting period is that when you watch out, you never know when Jesus is returning. Read with me in 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. And then he goes on to tell this parable of the faithful and wise servant. He talks about maxed out faithful service. And there's quite a bit of text to read. I'm going to ask Paul and Mary Acker to come up front. And instead of me reading through the Bible, we all have Bibles. We all have the Holy Spirit. Uh, We are God's people doing God's work together. So I've asked a couple people to read through these parallels. And then if they have any, uh, any insight as they read through it as as they were praying through it this week, uh, to share some of that with us. So, Paul and Mary, thank you for sharing with us. And this is the parable of the faithful servant. Thank you. I'm going to be reading from verse 45 through 51, if you wish to follow. Who then is that faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. 
But if that wicked servant says to himself, my master's delayed and begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drinks with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. As I thought about this, the parable really could be understood at two levels. On one level, the parable is about servanthood. And here Jesus draws a very sharp contrast between two servants. One is called faithful and wise. The other is called wicked, I suppose, because unfaithful and stupid. The first is commended and given more, up, more responsibility and greater social honor. The second is condemned and severely punished and disgraced. So I ask myself, what kind of servant do I choose to be? I can devote myself to self-indulgence, ignoring the likelihood of the Lord's soon return. I can be so self-absorbed that I neglect the needs of those around me. I can sacrifice the long-term blessing for temporal pleasures. Or I can choose to follow my calling into serving others, however humble a service. I can choose to follow the self-sacrificing path of Jesus, who said he came not to be served, but to give his life a ransom for many. I can choose to live a joyous expectation of his, of his return, despite the hardships of walking the narrow path. I can ask for help in developing in me one of the major characteristics of our God, that is, servanthood. God, in his wisdom, gives us the choice. Mary has another level, I think, going a little bit deeper in understanding this terrible. In context, the last thing Jesus said before telling this parable was, Therefore, you also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The faithful and wise servant knew his master's will and did accordingly. The other servant followed his assignment only when the master was home. <clears throat> the servant also knew his master's expectations, but chose to be irresponsible while his master was away, rather than standing in position ready to serve. What do I find in this parable for my life today? I need to search my heart. Is there any hypocrisy there? Am I faithful to the call and instructions the Lord extends to me, as he does to each one who has been born anew into his kingdom? Have I learned through prayer and the promptings of the Spirit how he wants me to serve him and others each day? Am I in position, ready to serve Readiness is not just being born again and saved for an eternal home. It is also being prepared for God's kingdom work. Am I in the place God has called me to be, prepared, dressed, and ready to do the work that he has planned for me to do now and in his eternal kingdom? Am I ready? The answers to these questions lead me to prayer. Thank you for sharing. Isn't God's word so cool? Yeah, I, I, we, didn't, uh, we didn't coordinate these things. And people had asked me when I said, hey, could you, could you think of sharing? They said, sure, pastor, what do you want me to say? And I said, say whatever the Spirit leads you to say. Uh, it's so encouraging to hear. And thank you both for sharing. Imagine a life that has maxed out on faithful service. Imagine a maxed out life with faithful service. The faithful servant did his master's will even when the master was gone. He didn't think how little he had to do or how much he could get away with or he didn't think 
about the fact that the master was gone and would return in the far future. No, he just did the master's work faithfully. Imagine a life characterized by maxed out faithful service. That instead of saying that we're too busy, that we would invest in holding babies in the nursery or serving in children's church or shaking hands with people that come through the front door or uh, hosting a life group. Imagine a lifestyle that would always look for more ways to serve God. A maxed out faithful service lifestyle is one that remembers our missionaries throughout the year and faithfully writes to them and encourages them throughout our missionaries throughout the world. Why don't you today just take a moment out and write a letter to someone who you appreciate their service in the Lord. Encourage them in their faithful service. A maxed out faithful service like we talked about last week doesn't mean that when you retire from your job, you retire from service from the Lord. We desperately need Multiple generations serving together. Imagine the depth of tradition, the depth of theology, the depth of Christian discipleship that can be carried down through the generations as we serve together. I imagine a young family that may feel too stressed out and too busy that jumps on this maxed out faithful service idea and instead of cleaning their own house on a Saturday, looks for someone else, in the, even in the church body, They may have trouble keeping up their yard or keeping up their house, and they go and serve someone else in the church. Let's be characterized by maxed out faithful service. The next parable Jesus tells, Justin, why don't you come up? Uh, The next parable that Jesus tells is the parable of the ten virgins. We're going to see here, uh, Jesus talks about maxed out, not maxed out faithful service, but maxed out preparation. Maxed out preparation. Thank you, Justin. Come on up. So then the kingdom of heaven will be like the virgins who took their lamps and I mean, went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, <clears throat> they all became drowsy and slept, but at midnight there was a cry. Um, here's the bridegroom, come out uh, to meet him. Then those virgins rose and and, uh, trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, "Uh, Give us some of your oil, for your lamps are going out. But the uh, um, the wise answered, saying, "Um, Since um, there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Um, And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the And the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, um, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Hmm. And I um, I was thinking about this this week, and um, as you guys know, my grandma passed away. And I kind of feel like she, like in the last one, she was the faithful servant who she like throughout my life, she, um, I knew she prayed for me when I was in Brazil the first time at, um, after high school. And then uh, when I went uh, to Brazil, uh, sorry, I'm um, to Brazil the second time, her and grandpa, I knew every day they prayed for me. And she, I, I mean, she took her, um, her lamp with her when she died. And I mean, she's the, uh, I mean, my life, both of them were my faithful servants. Um, I'm praying for our family and praying, I mean, and she uh, took, um, took me to the throne of Christ. And, I mean, I don't know. So she's one of the faithful virgins who took her lamp. And, I mean, I mean for me in my life, I need to do that for my family as well. I pray for them. And, but thanks. Mm. Thank you for sharing, Justin. Maxed out faithful service, maxed out preparation. You see, both of these parables have in in common that there's a delay, and it's what people do in the delay that's important. 
There were some folks that brought enough, some of the virgins that brought enough oil during the delay. You notice that they all fell asleep? Everybody fell asleep, and that's not a bad thing, but then they woke up and it was, it was time to go. And there were some that were ready and some that weren't. What would a maxed out life of preparation look like? That we're always ready for Jesus to come back. That we're always ready to do what God wants us to do. We prepare over and over and over again for the second coming of Christ, for the work that God has for us to do. Think about any big event that you've had in your life, whether it's uh, been graduation from college, you line up all of your credits, make sure you've taken all the right classes so that you are sure when you walk across the stage that you really have graduated. And you, you want to make sure if you're preparing for a big test in your field, in your profession, that you've studied and you study and you study and you know the material when you go in there. Uh, if you're planning a wedding, you focus on all these details of the wedding to get everything right in order so that everything goes smoothly. When I go on a backpacking trip, I lay out all of my gear to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. And I make sure everything is in order. Everything is packed right. Do we take God's work as seriously as preparing to graduate or backpacking or a wedding? Do we take doing God's work that seriously that we are always prepared for what God has in store for us until Jesus comes? Maxed out preparation asks questions like this. How do I spend my time? How do I spend my money? What do I think about? A maxed out preparation scans relationships and says, God, who do you want me to talk to about Jesus next? God, send somebody my way so that I can tell them about Jesus. Maxed out preparation takes a great priority in spending time with God, of connecting with God, praying with God. Does anybody play sports? Anybody play sports? There's, there's usually a, a sports ready position, Right? So your, your feet are apart, uh, shoulder width apart, your knees are bent, your hands are up. In some position, you're ready. I want you to stand with me for a second, please. Stand with me and just, just get comfortable. If you're, if you're able, if you're able to stand. Now, if you're able to do this, get, get in the sports ready position with me. If you're able. All right, so for the next 20 minutes, we're going to stand like this in preparation. <laughs> you, can, you can sit down. Now you laugh because you're in this position and you start to feel it in your legs. You start to feel it in your arms. You go, oh, this is hard work to be prepared. Yes, it's hard work to be prepared. And it's constantly straining to be prepared. But we are to max out our preparation to always be ready for what God would have us do. We would say, God, we are about your will. We are about doing your work, not about doing our work. Not about a comfortable life. I think so many times uh, <laughs> I've noticed my spiritual life, I'm, I have kind of this posture <sighs> with God. <sighs> Instead of a posture like this, God, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? Who do you want me to talk to? Instead, it's focused on my own comfort. Oh, God, I'm <sighs> pretty busy here, pretty tired. No, 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 maxed out preparation. We're always ready to be about God's work. So we have maxed out faithful service, maxed out preparation, uh, and last we're going to see is uh, maxed out production. Maxed out production. Hans, you want to come up and read the parable of the talents. Jesus goes on to tell another story. Again, you'll see in this parable there's this season of delay that's the key to the passage. Thank you, Hans. This reading also is from the uh, book of Matthew, chapter 25, starting at verse 14. For it will be like a man going on a journey, who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. 
Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had the two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I thought about the, the reading. Of course, I'd heard it and read it lots of times before myself. And um, the thing that struck me this time was uh, uh, it says the servant was, uh, was afraid the third servant and so he hid the money uh, fear can be a terrible thing it can paralyze us into not doing anything and one of the commentaries I read said that it wouldn't have taken a whole lot for him to take that money to a, to a bank and put it and have interest earned and uh, I also discovered that uh, a talent is a lot of money uh, it said one talent in a couple of places that I read was worth anything from 15 to 20 years wages. One talent. That's what the third servant got to uh, watch over. So I can imagine if this, the, the owner was gone a long time, even that at interest would have earned quite a bit of um, benefit to the, to the owner. So... Uh, I had thought of my own life and how many blessings that God has blessed me with. The talents, time, treasure, and, and um, opportunities to do things. And uh, I've been afraid before. I was certainly not a little bit nervous about going to Africa with Caroline a few years ago. That's a pretty big step and it can be kind of intimidating. And uh, a lot of people that have known me for a long time know that I don't, never learned how to swim. And uh, I'm kind of afraid of water. But uh, those kind of fears have also denied me the opportunity to, uh, to experience some wonderful things. I wish I was a good swimmer. And I wish I would take more uh, opportunities that I've, I'm, I've been given to to step out of my fear and uh, do things for the Lord. And I've gotten better in the last few years and uh, I'm praying to the Lord that he will continue to give me the uh, desire to overcome my fears and step out in faith. Because I know that he's with me wherever I go and will be always. And so that's just what I wanted to share. Thank you, Hans. Sure. Thank you.
maxed out production. Maxed out faithful service, maxed out preparation, and maxed out production. If the master were to return right now, where would his talent be? Where would the resources that God has given you be found? Would they be found invested in kingdom work or squandered and buried? Max out your production for the Lord. And you may say, I know, Pastor, but I'm so tired. I don't have the energy to do God's work. I bet I'll get an amen on this, that when we are about God's work, we get the energy to do God's work. Amen? When we are focused on what God has us to do, when we are ready to go, when we are preparing to do God's work, when we are productive in the Lord, we have all this newfound energy. It's like a new life. Amen? When we find ourselves busy with our own lives, busy with fruitless activity, It's draining, yes, but when we are focused on God's work in fruitful ministry, it encourages us to keep going strong. Brothers and sisters, max out your production for God. You still have breath. You're still here. You're still with us. Max out that production for the Lord. Young families, you may feel like you are just drained because your kids suck the living life, living energy out of you. At all times, you, I, I don't know about you, I didn't drink coffee until I had two young kids in diapers, and then all of a sudden I started drinking coffee. You may feel like you're too tired. And young families, you may feel like your kids are your ministry, and you should. You should make time to make your family your ministry. But your family is not your only ministry. We can't be an ingrown family and just focus on ministering to our family. Imagine a maxed out production uh, of your whole family, of leading your whole family in doing God's work together. You may have some unknowns in your life right now. You, maybe you're looking for another job or you're uh, going back to school or you're on a new venture. There's some unknown in the future. A lot of times we can be focused on what's unknown about us in the what's unknown about our life in the future instead of what God has for us to do right now. Max out your production today knowing that God will provide for you in the future. Max out production for the Lord right now. You have breath. You're here with us. God has work for you to do. Only do what only you can do in the Lord. Only do what only you can do. There, are, there is a reason that God brought you into this community. Only do what God has for you to do for his glory. Max out production. Maybe you're an empty nester. The kids have left the house. You've just survived the marathon of parenting kids in the home, and they've left the house. And now, because they're, they're out of the house, you have all sorts of free time, don't you? <laughs> That's not how it works, huh? There are a growing number of folks in a, in a huge generation that the kids are now moving out of the house, uh, beginning to retire. Darby's folks have just retired, uh, beginning retirement, a whole bunch of extra time. Chances are you have more time and more resources, more money than you did when you had kids. Uh, That's a generalization, I know. Imagine what God could do with a growing number of people that have a growing amount of open and free time. Imagine what God could do for his kingdom work with that. Max out production. You still have breath. Max out production. And you may be thinking, Pastor, I've done the family thing. I've done the retirement thing. I've done the empty nest thing. I just want to do the heaven thing right now. I want to be there with Jesus right now that I would say amen, but you're still here with us. We desperately need you. We as a church body need multiple generations pulling together. We have this idea that newer equals better, and that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of rich tradition, a lot of rich theology, a lot of mistakes that can be shared. Don't do it this way. (laughs) Try it this way. And we need that 
to max out our production for the Lord. And we need to all pull together as a church family to max out our production for God. I don't know about you, I don't want to be the wicked and lazy servant. I don't want to take the resources that God gives me, the resources that he gives my family, the resources that he gives our church body. I don't want to use that and squander it, bury it because we're afraid. Brothers and sisters, max out in the meantime. You may feel tired. You may feel worn down. I want to encourage you. You're still here with us. Jesus hasn't come back. Max out in the meantime. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to make the most out of our time. We still have breath. And Jesus, you haven't come back yet. And so while you are delayed, while we wait, Help us to make the most out of this time for your glory. Not for our fun or our enjoyment, but for you, God. God, from this point on, we pray that you would make the most out of every effort. That you would stir our hearts with a renewed passion for your work and help us to live maxed out lives. All of God's people said together, amen.